Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Erica Sigurdsson, and welcome to Making History. So we're going to be doing something quite different from our usual today, because I feel it's important to talk about the recent educational news out of Florida, and specifically the approval last week by the Florida Education Board of an absolutely appalling Black History curriculum standard. So this video today is in many ways outside of what I have done and what I want to do in the future with this channel. I'm a medievalist. I don't like news. I don't like current events and I have no intention of moving in the direction of like responding to the news cycle. That sounds horrible to me. And in some ways, I'm not the most well suited to this discussion. I'm not at all an expert in American history. Honestly, I'm not a massive fan of modern history at all. I strongly prefer the more distant past. I'm also not an expert in black American history and I don't want to in any way represent myself as such. I am a historian. I've been trained extensively in historical methods and the principles and ethics of doing history. And with that experience, I can recognize bad history when I see it, which we'll get to. But it's also part of that training and frankly, part of the ethics and quality control that we as historians need to know and express the boundaries and the limits of our knowledge. I'm not seeing that from the writers of this curriculum document, and that's part of what I'm finding so disturbing about it. So what that means is that I will not be talking a lot about the subject matter, so Black American history or the history of slavery in the Americas. There are experts in this field, but I'm not one of them. The way I want to approach this, I think the value that I think I can add has to do with, well, it's like the name of this channel, making history. How do we understand and use history in the present day? This is something that I really want more people in the world today to understand. I want people to really understand that history is not made by people in the past doing things. History is made by historians trying to make sense and make meaning out of the sea. And it really is a vast ocean of random facts and random data left behind by the people of the past. That's an enormous part of my goal with this channel. I actually think in my very first video, I used the slightly grandiose phrase, you know, the uses and misuses of history. <laughs> so today we are going to be talking about a particularly egregious, in my opinion, misuse of the past and of history. So something that I haven't shared with you yet is kind of my origin story, my reason for starting this channel. And it's actually because of that, because of my origin story, that I do feel so strongly about tackling this topic, this Florida curriculum with you today. Because I actually first started thinking about this channel right here, and I think it was 2021 when in my province, Alberta in Canada, released a curriculum draft with an awful, regressive, and nonsensical social studies program. I'll link a couple articles if you want to know a little bit more about it, because I don't want to get too sidetracked by the details of that. But unlike the situation in Florida, the Alberta curriculum leaned heavily on outdated and frankly racist, or at least Eurocentric narratives with a focus on ancient and medieval history, which I am an expert on. And as I was watching that discussion back in 2021, one of the things I realized is that while many people saw that there was a problem with this curriculum, they could tell that there was something very, very wrong with the narrative it was pushing, but it was subtle. Again, unlike what's happening in Florida right now. And something that really worried me was that it seemed like many people couldn't quite put their finger on or couldn't quite articulate exactly what the problem was. Because the problem in the Alberta curriculum, and it's the same problem now in Florida, the problem was with the narrative. It was embedded in the structure of the entire document. So here in Alberta, we did see significant opposition to the 2021 curriculum draft, especially the social studies part of it. But because it's difficult to articulate opposition to a narrative, one of the things that happened was that opponents tended to pick up on specific examples, egregious examples from the curriculum, things that were easy to point to and say, well, this is bad. One example that I can remember was actually an economics assignment that was asking, I think, middle schoolers to write a business plan for the Canadian Pacific Railroad, which was built in the 1880s. And they were supposed to use the business plan to essentially justify the 19th century exploitation of Chinese laborers who were paid almost half of what white workers were paid and many of whom died doing the most dangerous jobs. You can find worse examples of that same ugly trend in this Florida curriculum, by the way, in sections that are ins insisting that the supposed financial benefits of enslaving people, well, it doesn't justify it, but, and that's unacceptable, but I'm digressing. My point was simply that the 
problem with focusing only on the egregious wrongs of those curricula is that we risk making it easy for these bad historians to just remove those individual pieces, right? But leave in place the foundational problems that I would argue do more damage to students because they're harder to uproot once those, once those foundational narratives have got into people's heads. In fact, I think we're seeing this already. I'd like you to watch this commentator from MSNBC, I think possibly doing some of that work for these bad historians. The actual curriculum, if you read it, it's just one line, right? It's just one line, does use the word benefit, uh, and that obviously is problematic. And what's striking to me, beyond just that it got to this point to begin with, which is crazy, uh, is that there's not someone in that orbit, in his universe, who has the maturity and the capacity to say, this wording is problematic, maybe we can go back and revise it. We recognize that we've sort of lit a fire. See the problem? Now I've been noticing that, it, at least in the media coverage, it has been extremely focused on, like this guy says, this one line. It's a single subsection that requires teachers to provide instruction on the benefits of slavery. Now, I agree with these critics that this is probably the most egregious single item in this curriculum. But this is very concerning to me because in my professional opinion, it would not be enough to simply remove that one line to make this curriculum acceptable. So I have over the past several days, read through this curriculum document very thoroughly. And I believe that there was almost nothing in the African-American history strand which is remotely acceptable as written. And to be clear, I don't know how much of it is original and how much of it has been adapted from earlier iterations of Florida curricula. How does it compare to what's currently being taught in Florida schools? I don't know. But I would love to hear from any of you who are teachers in the U.S. or know more about Black history and how it is usually taught in public schools. I would love to hear from you. Let me know in the comments if you have anything to add. But what I've done today and what I want to talk about for the rest of this video was to almost kind of ignore that context and just examine the curriculum document on its own terms as a work of history. So I've chosen not to focus my analysis on the document as a curriculum, kind of like from the perspective of a teacher having to apply it in the classroom. That's a whole other discussion. Though I will in a little bit show you an example of a different curricula, a different social studies curriculum that I believe showcases clearly what needs to be in a curriculum to make it useful for teachers. But I thought it would be useful to set that aside and actually analyze this document kind of the way I would analyze any work of history. And I wanna share part of that process by going over a single section in close detail. The section that I picked out, partly because I found I had a lot to say about it, but also because, again, in my opinion, I believe it is fairly representative of the work as a whole. What is this document? So the document is titled Florida State Academic Standards Social Studies 2023. It's 216 pages in a PDF of a Word document. It's organized by strands. So you have like American history, world history, civics, and so on. The only strand that's dated is this African-American history strand dated to 2023. African-American history is the first section of the document, pages 3 to 21. And within the section is organized first by grade level and then by standards and benchmarks. Okay, so the section that I've chosen for close reading is on page eight. I chose the nine through 12 material because it is the most detailed section. So the standard states examine the slave trade in the colonies from 1609. Within that standard, there are 12 benchmarks covering a series of topic areas in chronological order. I'm not entirely sure if there's some significance to the date 1609 that I'm not personally aware of, but I find myself wondering if that's maybe a typo and they meant 1619, which is a significant date. And I don't point that out as a mean like gotcha moment, but I do think it speaks to the overall lack of professionalism in this document that I would even have that suspicion. But regardless, I understand this section as being the history of slavery before American independence, before 1776, which is fine and makes sense. But I really want to dig in to this first subheading within that, um, which reads, examine the condition of slavery as it existed in Africa, Asia, the Americas, and Europe prior to 1619. I find this weird. This is in the context of an African-American history strand. It's not in the context of a history of slavery. So why start us off with a backgrounder in slavery through the ages? Personally, I think my inclination, if I were designing this, might be something like to start us off with a brief run through of the history and geography of West Africa prior to the slave trade 
and the uprooting of Africans and their forced removal into the Americas. But I'm not an expert. We'll leave that to them. But the narrative aim of this subsection really reveals itself in the series of five benchmark clarifications. You can sort of see that here. So the five benchmarks can be divided into three sections, three types, and I'm going to go through them now. The first type, in my opinion, are the three red herrings. Okay, the three red herrings, as I read them, are one, there was slavery in Asia. Two, indigenous Americans did slavery too. And three, let's get sidetracked by an etymological debate about the word slave and the possible, but probably not, origin in the word slav. Those three, that's clarifications three, five, and half of clarification four, just feel like, as I said, simple red herrings in the direction of well, everybody had slaves. And of course, that may or may not be true, but it's a distraction tactic. This is the, all my friends were doing it, of excuses. And I think we can all recognize that as insufficient, right? It's insufficient from a vaping middle schooler, and it's offensively insufficient from a state-mandated school curriculum. But the next two categories actually are even more insidious in that they are, in my opinion, attempts to exactly flip the perpetrator victim dynamic in this narrative. Do you see what I mean? So first, if we look at benchmark clarification one, we have trading in slaves developed in African lands. So this looks to me like it's trying to build up the Africans sold their own, they were the real monsters argument. And if you're curious about that myth, what it does and its real life consequences today, I actually found a really good master's thesis um, of all things, which I will be linking to. And it goes into and it goes into this myth in detail. But in short, this is a known anti-black myth. It's of course true that some African groups, e.g. Benin and Dahomey, um, were involved in the slave trade. But the goal of this myth is to dramatically overemphasize and blame Africans for their role in slave trading and dramatically underemphasize the role and the culpability of European and American slavers. It's not that the facts are wrong, although they're kind of wrong, it's the emphasis. Do you like that? I kind of thought that was funny. So for instance, we can also look at what these benchmark clarifications don't include. Why do these benchmark clarifications specify slave trading developed in Africa, which isn't even true, I don't think, but don't include a discussion of the slave trade developing in Spain and Portugal in the later Middle Ages and early modern period? That is significantly more relevant, in my opinion, as context for American slavery, especially in Florida, which I think was Spanish for a long time, wasn't it? So why aren't we talking about that? Why has that been excluded? It's an egregious omission. And when we put it together with the deliberate inclusion of the fact that trading in slaves developed in Africa, we can see how this curriculum document throughout the document selectively omits relevant facts while including less relevant and poorly contextualized facts in order to mislead and miseducate teenagers. And that takes us on to the last two benchmark clarifications in this section. So here we have Barbary pirates kidnapped and enslaved white Europeans and medieval Europe had serfs, not slaves. But this is where my knowledge actually does come in because as it happens, I actually know quite a lot about both of these topics. Firstly, again, weird choice for a class on African-American history. Is this really the place for a discussion of medieval serfdom? So serfdom is actually a very complicated, heavily debated concept. It takes a lot of nuance and a lot of time to understand it properly. Barbary pirates are neat, I guess. But is this the best use of time in an African-American history class? In my opinion, no. Not if you're doing it right. What I suspect this document is hinting towards, though, is not a careful, nuanced, will-sourced discussion of the manorial system in medieval Europe. Prove me wrong. But my guess is that this has been introduced in order to argue that medieval Christian Europeans were better than others. Because while they did have serfs, who were kind of sort of unfree, they weren't slaves because the medieval church did not allow Christians to hold slaves. This is sort of true, but also not. It's a generalization that breaks down very quickly as soon as you start looking at the specifics, as soon as you start doing good history. And medieval historians are actually right now in an interesting process of reevaluating and changing some of our older beliefs about slavery and especially about racial consciousness in the Middle Ages. So all this means that that myth is not really true. I want to be clear again that this benchmark that I've just spent some time picking apart 
is not an exception. It's not the most egregious element in this document, not even by a long shot. You could do this, this in-depth criticism, for any one of these benchmarks. And with only a very few exceptions, you could find just as many offensive and misleading elements. There's actually probably a ton that I didn't even pick up on because as I've said, I'm not familiar with the subject area. So now I wanna introduce you to, um, just very briefly, to a different curriculum I did say, and I, I stand by it, that I really don't want to get into a discussion of how to use this curriculum as a teacher. I'm not a teacher, um, but I do find it weird. I find it, I, I, I would find it difficult to know what to do with this document as a teacher in a classroom. So what I'm going to show you right now is actually a curriculum from social studies grade 10 in British Columbia. You've seen already the, the Florida document. It's hard to read and it's hard to work your way through, actually. It's hard to understand what's going on in this document. I didn't even say this, but like, actually the African-American studies curriculum is repeated. So like the 18 or so pages, they've like reinserted it later on in the document. I don't know why, I don't understand it. Look at this, look at this curriculum right here that you have it you have a well-organized web document with you know core i'm not looking at it so i'm kind of just remembering you have the core ideas the core competencies and the big ideas so those are like themes that teachers can kind of come back to throughout the semester as they're kind of working through the material and if you look at the section that talks about material this is a this is a model of how to create a curriculum without ideology, without ideological spin. I looked, for instance, at the, I looked down the line into the section on um, Black Canadian history. There's not a ton. It's, it's not really, I don't think, a focus of this particular curriculum. But if you notice, look, all it says is a single bullet point that says Africville. It is, to be fair, a bullet point underneath a heading that reads discriminatory policies and injustices in Canada and the world, blah, blah, blah. So it does have context for the teacher, but it's a single bulleted word. The teacher isn't being barraged with these benchmark clarifications and anxiously insisting, this is what you have to teach about Africville. It's great. It's beautiful. It's well-designed. It's well put together. It's, it, this has been done with care. Looking at this, frankly, makes me increasingly angry at this Florida document. And there should be no offensive and misleading elements in a public school curriculum. That's how it should be. The degree of spin and just doctrinaire direction in this Florida document is just appalling and honestly just beyond words. I mean, I think you know this. I don't imagine I'm talking to anyone or speaking to an audience that doesn't understand, you know, what ideology is and how, how it operates. But I guess I'm hoping that this will help us, I don't know, stay clear and firm that none of this is okay. It's not enough to remove a certain section and then let it go, go out into the world. There is no portion of this Florida curriculum that is fact-based. There is no portion of this Florida curriculum that is even remotely acceptable. It's a document designed to promote white supremacist myths and alt-right talking points about black history and black people in the US. And it just makes me really sad for all the students and all the parents in Florida. It makes me angry. If you're in Florida and watching this, I wish you, I don't know, strength. And I'm sorry you're going through this. For everyone else, well, I don't know. Let's just stay curious, stay open, and do good history. I'll be back next week. We will be going back to the Middle Ages. If that sounds good, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.